All we are is yours. We belong to you. And without you, Lord, we can do nothing. And sweet Holy Spirit, we thank you for your presence that is here already. We thank you, O oh God, for the voice of the blood that is ever speaking better things than the blood of Abel. We pray, Lord, that this morning you will be glorified again through your word. Have your way now, Miss Holy Spirit, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Thank you all very much. Amen. Good morning again. Amen. Uh, you're welcome to the house of the Lord. And uh, this is Cornerstone Mountain Assembly. For those who are visiting with us for the first time, we welcome you. We really appreciate your presence. And we ask that the Lord will bless you this morning and uh, meet you all at the point of your needs. Amen. And uh, for those of us who have been coming, as we deal with the issue of uh, the ABC of prayer, uh, looking, uh, going concurrently with the, uh, the, the, the prayer of, uh, uh, in the book of Matthew chapter 6, from verse uh, 8, as we looked at, uh, been looking at the life of David in relation to the principle and the power of prayer. And last Sunday, for those of us who were here, we looked at a very powerful uh, testimony or story about the life of David. And uh, a very strong, important question was asked, uh, and who dropped you? Amen. And as we looked at that last Sunday, and in the same thought pattern this morning, we're still looking at Matthew chapter 6, verse 13. And the last part of verse 13 is where we'll be as we come or gradually to the end of the last prayer and going into the, the dimension that the Holy Spirit is leading us into as a church. And because when we started this year, our mission is to make us into a strong, prayerful, intercessory church. Not that we don't pray before, but because the time that we're living in, indeed, we are in the last days. As we hear what is happening around us, as we look around us and we we'll see how the world is gradually wrapping up with all the chaos and the disaster and the violence and the killing and, and the job loss and everything that has to do with the crisis and the heart of many are melting literally. Uh, and in some part of uh, our nation today, uh, the suicide rate is becoming so high and which is sad because when people don't know what to do, David cried out, he said, when my heart is overwhelmed, Lord, lead me to the rock that is high than mine. What if I don't have that rock to lean on? If I don't have God to turn to in the hour of crisis, in the hour of deep depression and, and that what is happening to a lot of people. And so that is the reason why as we look at the issue of prayer, that the issue of prayer in this last days cannot be overemphasized. So I'm saying that to say that as we begin to go into the second phase of our teaching on the issue of prayer and standing upon the power and the principle of prayer through the Word of God. We're going to be looking at the word and the phrase where Jesus said, Thy power and thy glory, thy kingdom come, your power and thy glory. And so as we look at that reason this morning, as we look at the glory of God, because the mission of Jesus was to restore glory and honor to the children of men. You know, the Bible says in the book of Romans, it says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now, the glory there in the book of Romans is not talking about the Shekinah glory that Moses saw when he went on the mountaintop and, and conversed with God. The Shekinah glory is different from the glory in the book of Romans when the Bible says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The glory of God there is talking about the nature of God, the nature of God. The Bible says in the book of Genesis that you and I were created in the image and the likeness of God. And so when God bred into a man in the beginning, the nature of God, the characteristics of God, everything that was embodied in God was bred into man, and man became like God in nature and in character. And so everything that was God was put into man. But what the enemy did was to try to take that away through sin and compromise. So the Bible says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And what Jesus did was this. The Bible said the reason why he was made manifest in the flesh was to destroy 
every works of the devil. And so Jesus came to restore you and me back to our natural position, to restore us back to that glory, that place of honor, that place of virtue, that place of joy, that place of peace, that place that is free from all the turmoil and the crisis of this world. And the thing about Jesus, being a child of God or being in Christ Jesus does not exempt you from crisis. But the good news is that the presence of God you know, the, the people say this, they say peace is the absence of war. That is not true. Peace is the, abs- is the presence of Jesus in the midst of your crisis. And so what God has come to do was to restore that glory back to us. And the enemy, just like he did in the Garden of Eden, is still committed to taking that glory away from you and me. And we saw that in the life of Meshiboshet last week. When a boy or a man who was born a royalty, born into a kingly lineage, but because of somebody's mistake, he lost his place and his throne, and he was reduced into a place of nothingness. A boy who was born a prince began to refer to himself as a dog. And that is such a painful story. Every time I read that story, it reminds me of a life of so many of us that though we were born great, though we are meant for signs and for wonders, but due to some issues in our life, the enemy has so changed us and we are not living our life to its full potential. And this is why Jesus came to restore back that glory to us. And so thy power and thy glory. This is what Jesus was teaching us, the power and the glory of God. What does the power do? The power does one thing. The power comes to restore back the glory, the natural nature that God has intended for me. My position as a child of God on earth fear. The Bible said through Paul to the people uh, in the book of Peter, he said, God has rescued us. In Colossians, he said, he rescued us from the dominion of darkness into his marvelous light. And he said, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus, Ephesians 2.10. And this is the mission of God to bring us to that place of honor and glory. But the enemy wants to take that away. And he's fighting you and me on a daily basis like he did to Meshiboshetha. And this morning, we're going to look at another character again that was meant for honor, meant for power, meant for a high position of elevation, but yet the enemy was trying to block him from entering into his desired place in destiny. And my prayer this year is that every one of us, no matter the obstacle, no matter the turmoil that you're going through, no matter the storm in your life this year, that the Lord is going to make the sun to shine over you again in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So God wants to restore us. The Bible said, Jesus, of John speaking in the book of John chapter 1, verse 12. He said, as many as believed in him, he has given them power to become. And that is to say, it is believing in Jesus that enabled me to become anything I want to be in life. He said, as many as believed in him, he's given them the power to become the sons of God. So when I believe in Jesus Christ as the author and the finisher of my faith, he gives me, I'm empowered to be restored to my place of glory. I'm empowered to take back my, my position that the enemy took away from me. And this is the heart of the gospel of Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. And so we see this morning a story in the book of Esther. And uh, Esther chapter 2 verse 21. To 23 and Esther chapter 4 verse 12 to 6. And I want you to write that down so that you can go through it. I, I want to challenge you that this week try to read the whole book of Esther. It's going to give you the whole picture because time will fail me this morning to read the whole story, the whole chapter. But I'm just going to give you a background to the story. You know, the book of Esther has to do with the people of Israel or the Jewish nation that were all, they were taken captive into the patient kingdom. And after a while, you, if you know the story of uh, the book of Esther, the king of that land wanted to talk to the queen and wanted to show her up. And uh, she became stubborn and rude and refused to come see the king. And she was dethroned at that point in time. And a new queen called Esther was installed in her place. And that is the background of the whole story, the dynamics. But this Esther woman was an orphan. 
was, at, and, and being an orphan, she was adopted by her uncle called Mordecai. And Mordecai is the principal actor in what we want to talk about briefly this morning. And Mordecai, being the uncle of Esther, he was also part of the, the council of elders in the king's palace. But in this, on, at this particular occasion, there was a man called Haman that hated Mordecai for no reason, but the reason being that Mordecai was a Jewish man, and he hated him for that. And the story went this way, that Haman became so angry with Mordecai that he planned to kill him. And he was planning to hang him in a gallow. He made a big gallow to hang Mordecai. That was how angry and how resentful he was towards this man. But the story had this to say about Mordecai. Mordecai was a good man, a faithful man, who had done so much for the king. There was a time in his life that he saved the life of the king. People were planning to kill the king. And Mordecai he had overheard them and reported them. And so that was how the king's life was saved. But when you do such a great thing, you were supposed to be rewarded. But Mordecai was forgotten. How many of you feel forgotten this morning in life? Mordecai was forgotten for years. Nobody remembered him to reward him for the good thing that he had done. And instead of getting the reward, now his life was at stake. Now they want to kill him instead. But the Bible said something. I want us to look at the, at the, at the book of Esther chapter 6 this morning. I want to read that briefly. Esther chapter 6, from verse 1. On that night could not the king sleep, and he commanded to bring the book of records of the chronicles, and they were read before the king. And it was found written that Mordecai had told of the Tagna and Teraj, the two of the king's chamberlain, the keepers of the door, who sought to lay hand on the king. Asaruses. And the king said, what honor and dignity had been done to Mordecai for this? And I believe that this is the story of many of us. You know, the time for our restoration is near or close by. We know that we are supposed to be honored. We know that we deserve more in life than what we are getting this morning. And yet nothing seems to be done about it. We know that we deserve the promotion in our job. You know, we've been working there for 10 years, for 20 years. And every time we've been bypassed, people bypass us. We know we've been faithfully married for two years or five years, expecting that joy to be restored into my marriage situation. We know you have been jobless for so many months now, and it's time for you to get a new job. And every other person is getting what they deserve. Yet every time it is close to you, you've been by, 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 by past or neglected or forgotten. And God and, and, and the king now, at this particular time, this is what God is about to do for us as we stay in a place of prayer. The Bible said that night, the night that Haman was planning to kill him, the Holy Spirit woke up the king. And for the first time, he went and the book of remembrance was opened. Listen to me, child of God. You may, be, you may be feeling forgotten right now, but God is not forgotten you. At the right time, you'll be remembered. Mordecai thought God has forgotten him. I believe he thought everything is gone and he was going to die. And the funny thing about for those of us who are Bible students who understand the Bible very well, I will tell you something about Haman. Haman is the great, great, great grandson or is of the lineage of the Agates, the first king or the nation in 1 Samuel chapter 15. Now listen to this very carefully. When Saul, now the dynamics of the story, why I wish I even I want to do a Bible study on just this, this story alone because it's so deep. Mordecai is the great-grand-grandson of King Saul. He's of the tribe of Kish. He's of the tribe of Benjamin. Now, 
King Saul was given an instruction by God to kill the Agath and wipe them out. And he refused to obey. You see, what you don't take out will take you out. Amen. The habit you refuse to deal with today will deal with you tomorrow. The things you take for granted will ground you. Saul took the instruction of God for granted and refused to follow that instruction because God knows the end from the beginning. Some of the things that God tells you and me to do or to walk away from, it's not because God does not want you to enjoy. It's not because God does not want you to have a good life because he knows what the end of that choice is or habit is going to be. When Saul refused to kill them, now it was the same person that later gave birth to Haman now that turn around and want to deal with him. Can you imagine? Because the enemy never forgets. And he came when, the, when we least expected. That is when that thing that you've been hiding, that habit, is going to creep in on you to blow you out. And the enemy knows how to take you out if you're not careful. That is, the, that is the, 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 the complex thing about the story. Anyway, this morning, that's not what we're going to talk about briefly. And God remembered Mordecai when it mattered the most. At the time when the enemy was trying to take him out, when he thought all hope was gone, the king woke up and he said, what dignity, what honor and dignity has been done for this man, for the good that he has done. Listen to me, your labor of love is not in vain. But the thing is that God wants to restore you to glory. Mordecai belongs, he belongs in the throne. God has assigned his life for glory and for honor, but the enemy was committed to making sure that he never attained that place of glory and honor. And for many of us, the same thing is happening to you. God has marked you up for honor and for glory. God wants to establish you. God wants to lift you high. God wants to want you to have a wonderful marriage. God wants you to have a good life. But the enemy is committed to making sure that that never comes to to pass in his lifetime or in your lifetime. And that is why we we'll suffer the things we we'll suffer. Mordecai was of the lineage of Benjamin, the strength of God. But here he was, not able to realize his full potential in the Lord. And the enemy was not satisfied with that. He wanted to take him out. The Bible says in the book of Psalm 3, the Lord is the glory and the lift out of your head. The enemy is, one of the things that the enemy is wanting to do and wants to do in your life and in my life is to deprive you of your promotion, to deprive you of your joy, to deprive you of your place in the kingdom of God. And one of the things that can, the enemy can use to deprive you of your glory on earth here is bitterness of heart by other people, you know, towards you can hinder you when people hate you for no reason. How many times have you seen people that just don't like you? Not because you've done anything wrong to them. People just despise you for no reason. People just treat you bad for no reason. Haman just hated Mordecai just because he's a Jew. How many times do people hate you because of the way you look? Amen. <laughs> people just hate you. Sometimes people look at you and say, the way he talks, I don't like it. And that becomes a problem. I don't like the way he walks. I don't like the kind of vehicle he drives. And people will find any reason at all to hate you. And so Mordecai was hated by him and not because he did anything wrong. And what happened is that the enemy can use offense both ways to close and to hinder you from getting your desired blessing in life. And what the enemy does is this, and God has showed me that, you know, lately, and he said, listen, offense is a very terrible weapon in the hand of the enemy. If you don't deal with offense well, offense can become a fence that will fence you out of the blessings of God. And so the enemy can try to offend you. The Bible says in Psalm 119 verse 165, 
He said, great peace have they that love the law. They shall not be offended or nothing will offend them. Because the enemy will try to use people or situation to offend you, to get you offended, to get you angry. And when you get angry, when you get offended, that is when you do things you're not supposed to do. When you get offended, you talk the way you should not talk. When you get offended, anger comes and you behave in an unseemly way. And that will hinder you from getting the blessings that God has for you. And we can't allow the enemy to do that to us. Because the enemy wants to bury us in that grave of forgetfulness like he did to Meshibosheth. And Mordecai was forgotten. So he thought his glory was being hidden but not hindered. Right now, there are many of us here this morning, and what I want to mention briefly, and next week we're going to deal with each one of them in detail, and in the next couple of weeks, these are the things we're going to be talking about and prayerfully dealing with them one after the other. And as we look at the life of Mordecai, and I look at the glory of God for you, what God has intended for you as a child of God, as a human being on earth here, why is your life full of so much troubles and heartache and pain and disappointment and sorrow? What is it that every time you're about to make one move, something wrong happens? Something goes wrong all the time. Why is your story different from your brother's? Why is your marriage different from your sister's? Why is it that it's your story? Why is it that it's your life that is full of pain and headaches or heartaches? Why should it be you? And we want to see why in many lives. Because some of the things that are happening to us are not, it's not coincidence. They calculated a plan by the enemy to, to destroy you and to make you ineffective and unproductive in this life. A man sang a song, he said, you think you're living in heaven, but you're in hell. Some of us are hell on earth in our situation. We have this idea of living, but our life, when people you know, by the time they look into your, your life, your situation is full of nothing but pain. The story of your life is pathetic and pitiful. And that is not a plan of God. God wants to change that. God wants to rescue somebody this morning and this week and this week and this month. As we go into the month of March, I believe that we're going to be marching forward into a place of victory, into a place of glory. Amen. And the enemy, you know, what he does is like he did to Mordecai is to take your life. The Bible said something here. I want to read a scripture quickly as we take up Hosea chapter 13 verse 14. Can you put it up there? God wants to ransom you. Hosea chapter 13 verse 14. I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O death, where is thy plague? O grave, I will be thy destruction. And repentance shall be healed from thy eyes. God is saying, I want to ransom you from the power of the grave. What do I mean by that this morning? And these are the things we're going to be looking at in the next couple of Sundays. You know, where grave means unfulfilled ambition this morning. We're not just talking about physical death. You know, just like Mordecai, though he was alive, but he was just, you know, his, um, his life was not fulfilled for a period of time. The enemy put a wedge between him and his, his promotion, his desired reward. There was a reward meant for Mordecai, but he could not attain to it. And for so many of us here, there are things you know. You know, how many times do you look at your life if you believe that I deserve better than this? I deserve more from life. Life is not fair to me. 
Life is not being fair to me. Why is life treating me this way? You hear people say that all the time. That is to say the enemy has taken your destiny and locked it up in the grave. And that is to say your desire, your dream, your wish for your children, you will never see them fulfilled. That is the plan of the enemy. Your desire for your marriage will never come to pass. The dream that you had growing up as a child will never come to fruition. And when the enemy lock your destiny up in the grave, that's what the Bible says. It said, I will ransom you from the power of the grave because the grave is the spiritual bank of the devil. Grave means unfulfilled ambition, unfulfilled dreams. And to bury, when the enemy buries you, it meant literally to, the, to be put on the ground. It also means to conceal you out of sight. And so when something is concealed out of sight, when your destiny, you are supposed to shine. You're supposed to be a star. You're supposed to be very successful. You are meant to have a wonderful marriage, but the enemy has concealed that part of your story out of sight. It's not that it's not there, but nobody can see it. When people see you, all they see is nothing but failure and despair. Mordecai was meant to reign in that land, but his destiny was concealed out of sight. His reward was concealed out of sight for a period of time. Because the grave is a place of isolation. And quickly, for those of you, if you want to write, these are the seven things that the enemy hides in the grave. Your glory, number one, is your star. Who you are supposed to be in heaven. Numbers chapter 24, verse 17 says, I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not right now. There shall come a star out of you. God said there is a star that is meant to come out of you. There shall come a star out of Jacob. And one of the things that the devil conceals out of sight is your star. What will make you shine forth both in heaven and on earth? He concealed it through the crisis that he manipulated. And God wants to deliver you and bring you out of that. We'll be looking at that in detail next week. The second thing that the enemy conceals out of sight is your glory. What you're supposed to be among men. Your vision, the secret of your life. Your ability to see and make something out of your destiny. And God is saying, your reward, God is the power and thy glory. We started this prayer thing and the, the, the teaching about the ABC of prayer with our Father who art in heaven. Our Father who art in heaven because God is in heaven. And he loves you, hallowed be his name, his kingdom come. His will be done on earth as it is in heaven. His will be done on earth. Whatever God is, what is happening in heaven is what we want to happen in our lives. We believe that in heaven there is no pain, there is no sorrow, there is no grief, there is no death. Even those who don't go to church, those who don't believe in God, when they lose a loved one, they say he's in heaven and he's free from pain now. Amen. When we hear the word heaven, we hear nothing but goodness and peace and prosperity. When we think of heaven, we think of nothing but joy and a street full of gold and, and all the beauties. That we, it's undescribable. And the Bible says, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So whatever is happening in heaven is what is meant to be happening in your life and in my life. But the devil is trying to deprive you and me from attaining into that place of joy and peace on earth here. And Jesus came to restore us to that place. Jesus came to give us life and to give it back to us more abundantly. Jesus said in the book of John chapter 10 verse 10, as we will wrap up this morning, just giving us a, a background of what we'll be dealing with in the, couple of, uh, the next couple of weeks. He said, the thief come not, but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I have come that you what? Will have life and have it to the full. Whatever the enemy stole from you, just like the king could not sleep until Mordecai was restored to his glory, the same thing is happening in heaven. 
when a child of God can cry out. If you read the whole story, the whole nation was praying and fasting. It was in the course of their prayer and fasting unto God that the fortune of Mordecai changed. Whatever the enemy has stolen from you, the king said, what honor and dignity has been done for Mordecai? What is it that you deserve, you know more than you know this morning, that I deserve better than this from life? I deserve to have this. My life is supposed to be better than this. My children should be doing better than this. Yet things are not going the way they should go. And God is saying, the enemy is trying to deprive you of your honor and your dignity and your joy. But Jesus has come to restore. Jesus is that king this morning. Just like the king naturally restored Mordecai back to that honor and glory, Jesus is the king of kings that can restore back to you whatever the enemy has stolen from you. Only Jesus can bring you back to that place where you belong, to that place of honor, to that place of joy, to that place of peace, to that place of wholeness. But we must recognize him in our lives. Jesus said, without me you can do nothing. He has come to give us life. Do you need a change? Do you want God to remember you? Then only King Jesus can make a way for you this morning. Shall we all stand up this morning? Just like the king remembered Mordecai, Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, want to remember you. Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith and my faith, wants to remember you. Jesus, the mighty one of Jacob, wants to remember you this morning. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He said, no one come unto me, come unto the Father except by me. In the book of John, the Bible says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was with God in the beginning. Without him was nothing made that was made. In him was life, and that life was the light of man. And he said, the light shines in darkness, and darkness cannot comprehend it. And there is a light that can shine into your dark situation and bring you out of your grave and bring you out of where the enemy has buried you to bring your star out again to begin to shine. And only Jesus can do that. He said, call upon me in the days of trouble, and I will answer you. Jesus is the one that can make a way where there seems to be no way. He said, come unto me, everyone that is heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus is the one that gave rest, just like the king gave Mordecai rest. Just like the king restored Mordecai back to that place of honor and dignity. God wants to dignify your life again. And the only way he can do that is only when you recognize the presence of the king, Jesus Christ, in your situation. Only then can the king restore you back to your rightful place where you belong. Jesus came to give you back what the enemy has stolen from you. Let's pray. As we pray this morning, if you need Jesus to help you do that, if you feel cheated out of life, if you feel that you've been so cheated, if you feel that life has not been fair to you, the only person who can make it right right now is Jesus Christ. Like Mother Kaya, the only person who can remember you and restore you back to your play, rightful place in life it's not man. The only person who can heal that marriage is Jesus. Just like the king woke up because of Mordecai, Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father this morning, making intercession for you. He said, call upon me, and I will show you greater mighty things that you know not. I want you to talk to God this morning on your own and say, Jesus, if you know that you need Jesus to help you this morning, it is time to tell him, Lord, remember me. Remember my children. Remember my marriage. My marriage deserves to be better than this. I deserve to be better than this. I deserve better from life. I deserve a better job. Lord, I need you to remember me. I need a job right now. Like Mordecai, the king, remember him. There is a king of kings in the house this morning that can remember you better than the king that remembered Mordecai. Jesus is his name. He said, call upon me and I will answer you. And for some of us this morning, the only way we can call upon him 
is to know him, is to acknowledge him as the king and the lord of our lives. And when we give him the right over our life, then we are qualified to talk to him about our situation. And you can talk to God this morning if you want to give him right over your life because until you fully give him the right over your life and he becomes the king of kings over your heart, only then can he step into the situation to begin to change them. And if you want to make Jesus the Lord of your life this morning, I just want you to lift up your hands as we all, all eyes closed this morning, wherever you are, and as we'll pray. And you can see after me, Lord Jesus. I surrender my life to you. I invite you into my heart as my Lord and Savior. I make you Lord of my life. I give you complete control of my life from today. Jesus, save me. Forgive me all my sins and cleanse me with your blood. And make me a new man, a new woman this morning. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. In Jesus' name. Father, I thank you for every soul here this morning. I pray for every family represented here this morning. I pray for every child this morning. I ask, oh God, for your healing power to touch them. For those, oh God, in their heart, they cry out to you, Father God, for their deliverance, oh God, this morning. I pray that you will show yourself mighty on their behalf in the name of Jesus. Father God, I pray that you'll be glorified in the house today, Lord. We pray for every need, O God. For those who feel cheated out of life, Father God, I pray that you will remember them this morning in the name of Jesus. I pray, Lord, that you'll be glorified in their situation in the name of Jesus. Father, we give you praise. Father, we exalt your name this morning. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. You may be seated briefly in the presence. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Uh, today is another glorious day. Uh, we want to present uh, this baby to the Lord. Uh, to dedicate a child means to give him back to the one who gave him to us in the first place. And when you dedicate a child, what you're saying is, Lord, I'm handing over this destiny unto you. Amen. And we're giving back this destiny unto you. We, we are saying, Lord, without you, he cannot go anywhere. And the Bible said, whatever is committed into the hand of the Lord, the Lord will keep. And especially when we commit a child uh, to, into the hand of the Lord like this, what happens is that you're making his destiny secured in the Lord. Amen. And you're saying that failure is no longer his portion in the name of Jesus. Because in God, there is no failure. The Bible says, those that belong to the Lord, we are meant for signs and for wonders. Amen. And so this morning, we are going to be doing that. Can the church, uh, can we all stand up as we uh, present uh, this child to the Lord together as a family? Because that is what it is. We come as a family and say, Lord, we are together agreeing. Amen. And so who wants to present, can I have the baby? Is he asleep? <laughs> going to present him to me. He's sleeping, eh? Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Where's Esther? Come and help me put this thing over him. Amen. Can you help me put the shawl over him? The shawl of protection. Amen. We want to defend the name. Uh, what are his names? Soya Charles Donut. Amen. Donut. And uh, I, Charles, I'm going to dedicate him as Charles because Charles means a warrior. Amen. It means a warrior, a defender. And as we dedicate this child, we're going to speak that into his life. That as we dedicate him to the Lord, that he will live out his name, that he will be a warrior in the hand of the Lord. That he will cause his entrance into your family will mark the beginning of breakthrough. That he will be a defense for you. That the Lord will use him to bring grace and honor to you. The Lord will use him to wipe away shame from your family. The Lord will use him as a pillar of honor and a pillar of refuge. That the Lord will use him to be a man sought out for. He will be a man that no evil will ever befall. 
He will be a man of honor, a man of grace. He will be a man of integrity. As his name is, so shall he be. In his going in and his coming out, he will remain blessed. Because he has come into your family for such a time as this. Whatever the enemy has stolen from you, any form of obscurity in your life, give way to the light of God. May this one be for the rising of your family. May his coming put an end to every devices of the enemy in your life. Whatever the enemy has stolen from you, because this one has opened up the womb of your womb, we pray, Lord, that the womb of breakthrough begin to open up in the name of Jesus. Whatever has been closed, any closed door in your family, by the reason of this dedication, we decree everything in your family dedicated unto the Lord. May the light of God begin to shine in your home like never before. Anything that had withered in your life will begin to receive new life. Because this is a new life that we present unto the Lord. The Bible says, anyone that openeth the womb is mine. For that God, we are not just dedicating the child, we are dedicating the firstborn of your daughter. That is to say, that which opened her womb, this is the one that opened the gate of life in her. And as we give him back to you, Lord, there is a double-fold return. When you give your first to the Lord, that is to say, every other thing become a supernatural grace. May the glory the glory of God begin to flow in your family like never before in the name of Jesus. And because you have chosen to give him to the Lord, whatever the enemy is holding back in your life will be returned to you in the name of Jesus. Father God, I cover this child. I dedicate you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. May this oil be a mark of distinction for you in the name of Jesus. No evil shall ever befall you again in Jesus' name. You will not be victim of any form of abuse in the name of Jesus. May this dedication separate you from harm, from pain in the name of Jesus. Lord, as we wrap you around with a shawl of protection, may you remain protected because whatever is committed into the hand of the Lord, the Lord will keep. We commit you into the hand of the Lord. With this dedication, we hide you in the secret place of the Most High God. And under his shadow, you will continue to abide. We say of the Lord, you shall remain, O God, your refuge and your fortress. No evil shall befall you by day or by night in the name of Jesus. We create a lifting up paddle for you in the name of Jesus. When others are crying, you shall laugh in the name of Jesus. When others are falling, you shall stand tall in the name of Jesus. When men are in pain, you shall be in gain in the name of Jesus. Where your mother has failed, where your parents have cried, you shall laugh in the name of Jesus. Their pain becomes your joy in the name of Jesus. The mistakes of your family becomes the, the joy and the platform for greatness for you in the name of Jesus. You will not fail in life in the name of Jesus. Because you have been dedicated to the Lord, the Lord that never fails, the Lord that has never lost a battle before. And as your name is Charles, so shall you be. You will never lose a battle in life. Whatever you set your hand to do will prosper in the name of Jesus. We cover you with the blood of the Lamb of God that speaks better things than the blood of Abel. With this dedication, we set you apart for greatness in the name of Jesus. Father God, as a church, can we just stretch our hand towards him right now? As a church, we agree that every word that has been spoken right now shall have a performance in your life in the name of Jesus. As a church, together we agree and we dedicate you again in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go and fulfill your destiny in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen. He wasn't crying. I think he was just saying amen. <laughs> You see, he just kept quiet. So now we've dedicated him, and on behalf of the church, um, I give him back to the granddad. You take him.
Now, what we do here, this is for, there's something for him and for you here. But other than giving a bed, uh, dedication certificate, uh, every time a child is dedicated here and when I'm called upon, even at that short notice, you know, we, I pray and I ask God for a word concerning that destiny. Because it's a dedication is a very spiritual thing because a name speaks about your destiny and your future, where you're going. And so with this, and so there is a word here, right? This is a prophetic word for your son, a prayer that God has just given us from the Church of Grace. And you can frame it also with the, with the certificate or keep it. And as he grows, you know, always remind him that this is the promises of God for his life. Amen. Thank you. So God bless you. Amen and amen. So, Father, we just thank you for this morning. We'll bless you for everything, even as we go into the fellowship hall now. We ask, oh God, that you be exalted by everything as we visit with one another. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you today and forevermore in Jesus' name. And we bless everything that is uh, put out there today, and we'll receive it with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, and God bless, and uh, you can move over.